Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Our hostess for today's program is Teresa Miller, Executive Director for the Oklahoma Center for Poets and Writers at OSU Tulsa. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very special guest today is nationally syndicated columnist, presidential biographer Richard Reeves. Straight from CNN to here, Richard. Right. Or C-SPAN. <laughs> or or C-SPAN. You know. We live on C-SPAN. We live on C-SPAN. I watch it a lot, too. You're nationally syndicated columnist. Column two times a week. Where do you find the discipline and inspiration for that? Because sometimes deadlines are hard to right. meet, and then you've got this regular audience out there waiting for you. Yes, and a syndicate who wants it on time. I, uh, I think I find that I th discipline... I'm okay with in writing at all times. Inspiration, uh, I think the column, which is, I've written that column for 25 years. I know. Uh, keeps me in touch. I, I had this fear that if I stopped writing a column, I'd stop reading the papers and paying attention mm -hmm. and just live with dead people, you know, from the Kennedy era or, well, or whatever. Call. So it, 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 the pressure is forcing me to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Keeping you current as you delve into yeah. the past. That's, I, I hadn't thought of it in that particular way. What are some of the most challenging columns you've had to write? Well, the most challenging columns are the ones that you have to write now, or at least I have to write now, in terms of when you're not part of the majority. Mm -hmm. When you're, you know, I mean, and I think, I think the, the Iraq situation has been badly mishandled. The president is nuts if he goes into a country like that because we'll occupy it forever mm -hmm. and people, they'll never uh, forgive us, they'll kill each other and they'll kill us too. Uh, so that's tough when you're kind of going against the national grain and you get all the nice letters saying you're a traitor. And, oh, I was going to ask stuff. you about that, but you've got to get a, uh, some letters to Richard that are saying thank you for saying this because we feel yeah. this and you're articulating yeah. some of our discontent and concern and, and absolute fear. Well, I, I have been, uh, that's exactly the way it is. After September 11th, I was getting a couple of hundred letters a day, and they were better, way better than 10 to 1 against me. And it was interesting to see that shift as things uh, calmed out now. And also it was interesting to see that, you know, I mean, I'm a liberal journalist, and whatever the conservatives think about uh, who's getting the space. It's conservative journalists now. I mean, my generation through civil rights, Vietnam and uh, Watergate, those, that was our life. Mm -hmm. And, but also the younger uh, commentators tend to be much more conservative. They, many of them were recruited yeah. and, uh, and trained and they were right. The conservatives were right. Uh, but so suddenly you find yourself getting these letters. I, you know, I get letters from things like, um, uh, do you accept mash notes from little 85-year-olds? This was from North Carolina. <laughs> because good. not many people are saying the emperor has no clothes these days. Mm -hmm. And so you, you pay mm -hmm. a price. You pay it both. I mean, the, the price you pay in public isn't bad. Internally, you don't like. I mean, I think America is a great country, and we're great people, and we're lucky to be here. But uh, when we criticize each other for a while, you've got to learn to duck. Yeah, well... Good, well taken, no uh -huh. matter what your profession in right. a way, if, if you're going to be true to your ideals. You do the column. You have five children. Yeah. You do documentary films, and you write books. Do all those pieces fit together as smoothly as it seems? No. <laughs> no, I should only write books. I should pay attention to my children. Uh, but uh, no, I, uh, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, I would do nothing uh, but write uh, the books because that's where my head is primarily engaged. But the fact of the matter is that today you not only have to write books the way the, the industry has evolved, you have to promote the books. To promote the books you've got to promote yourself probably more than you deserve uh, to be promoted so that uh, people know who you are. And there are 40, I guess it's 40, 60,000 books a year yeah, are published. At least. Yeah, and many of them are really good. I mean, there, you know, there's a real intellectual life in this country, but you're fighting all those people and they're fighting you. So it comes together that way. But 
truth be told, like most writers, I think if uh, if I never had to go out of the house, I uh, I wouldn't do it. You know, I mean, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm writing on uh, Reagan now, and also writing on a scientific book on experiments, mm -hmm. and I, there's a life of the mind and head that's going on with them, and I don't like to leave them to go uh, shopping to the grocery or to, uh, you know, or work on a different kind of work. Oh, but I have to do it to kind of remind people I'm around. Well, for one thing, it's enough to, to be balancing two different book projects. Yeah. Let's talk about, about your latest book, President Nixon, Alone in the White House. Uh, what made you decide to write about President Nixon? I. Uh, I had done the Kennedy book, and it was uh, it was a, a big success, mm -hmm. and so there was a certain pressure on me to follow it up. But in my head, what it was was these two uh, guys, Nixon and Kennedy, are really the bookends of my uh, professional mm -hmm. and intellectual life. I mean, mm -hmm. I graduated from college the year they ran against each other for president, and uh, in a way. Though they're not alive, they're both still here. Oh, clearly. And I think we'll be here for a very, very long time. So the one did, I never thought I'd do another uh, presidential mm -hmm. book after that, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, uh, I, I want to know who Richard Nixon was. My family was Republican. My father uh, mm -hmm. loved Nixon. So I didn't have, though my politics were different, mm -hmm. I didn't have that visceral hatred. I've never had it of Nixon. I knew him. Spent time with him because we had we met by accident mm -hmm. and and had some uh, had some similar interests and whatnot and uh, I thought there's got to be more to this guy than disliking him. Oh well, oh, good point. And there's been so much written about him, Richard. Though you know all these books written and and you can draw on that as source material. But how do you keep your own unique perspective and not be too influenced by what other people have written? Uh, I do it by writing, by uh, reading early on uh, the things that I think are worthwhile that other people uh, have done. And then they say, I really want those books. I'm doing Reagan now, the same mm -hmm. thing is happening. I, I need those books to get the chronology in my head mm -hmm. and the names mm -hmm. of the characters. And then from that begin to, to put together the way I'll I'll work at it, and by the end uh, of of the process, which takes, I hope it's shorter this time, uh, six or seven years, Major uh, I have moved, or I think I've moved, well beyond what uh, what other people have done. So the length of a presidency and a half. Yeah, right. He, to do it, of course, you're right. They, he can live it in four years, but you can't understand it <laughs> no. in four years. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned the, the, the President Kennedy book, Profiles in Power, and then now Alone in the White House. How does the nature of the man dictate the kind of research you do? I think that that would, you know, in terms of interviewing and so forth, have some influence on the kind of research you do. Yeah, it has great influence because uh, the presidency is sui generis, and only 42, 43 people know what it's like to be president. But the one constant is, and I think it would be the same if you or I mm -hmm. uh, were president, that the office is so sui generis, the power also is so great, that they, each man constructs, tries to construct uh, a presidency that's an extension of his mm -hmm. own personality. In uh, Nixon's case, that betrayed him because there were yeah. things wrong uh, with his personality. But they all do it, and eventually, as they're learning on the job, uh, they come to adjust that. Some adjust it well, bring out the best in the American people. Some adjust it badly and bring out the worst in the American people and sometimes in themselves. Well, isn't there, too, you were mentioning the isolation of a writer. I would think the isolation of a president is that to the extreme that you have this little world inside the White House and you make the public appearances, but oftentimes your statements are written for you. Well, is there a total loss of perspective sometimes? Oh, yeah. There can't not be. I mean, no human being can say, you know, most of us spend our lives talking, 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 and nobody listens, particularly our children. <laughs> uh, the, when presidents speak, uh, everyone listens. Mm -hmm. And one of the better examples of that that I was a little involved in because I happened to be at the White House because Clinton uh, was reading the Kennedy book and he wanted to talk about 
uh, Kennedy, but Clinton had got himself in a corner because he had said quite casually mm -hmm. uh, that he thought maybe America should welcome uh, the boat people from Haiti, or mm -hmm. not, not, mm -hmm. not welcome them, but at least not right. send, push them back out right. to sea. Well, the next morning there were 10,000, 100,000 boats were being built in Haiti because they thought yeah. they, they would come. And Clinton was terrified of the power of his own voice. I mean, you know, he sure. still, it was very early in his presidency, he was still Bill Clinton figuring out, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> and yeah. then he found out that if the president speaks, things happen. And it takes all of them. Bush has made some of his blunders uh, because he doesn't understand that if he makes a mistake speaking, which obviously he does uh, sometimes, uh, things happen. Mm -hmm. Right. because those words resonate in a way no other words on the planet do. It's really always high volume, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there, there, there's no escaping that. Since you're acquainted with the two men through your, through your books and through your, your, your interviews with them and, and so forth, Kennedy and Nixon, I was interested, in, Ken, uh, Nixon was so tormented by the Kennedy mistake. Right. I wonder if you might speak to that a little bit. Well, I've been living that. The, uh, he, his life was so... Uh, Richard Nixon's life was so tormented by John Kennedy's life. They started in the Congress together. They were both mm -hmm. in the Navy. They were the same age. They were both lieutenants. And Nixon, what Nixon spent, his, Nixon had uh, three things he, uh, he loved. And uh, sports was one of them. Uh, managing political campaigns was the other. He liked to manage other people's, mm -hmm. his own, uh, and then getting even with them. And to Richard Nixon, them, was uh, the guys he thought had it easy, who went to Harvard, who went to Yale, mm -hmm. who were born rich while he was on a scrub farm in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And suddenly then he's confronted with uh, his worst nightmare, which is John Kennedy. And, and of course, he was, Nixon was a big favorite to win that election in 1960. Oh, sure. And Kennedy turns out winning it when and Nixon and he feel to Nixon it's just another example of the unfairness of the world that I'm going to get uh, whatever they do it was also complicated by the fact that Nixon was so socially uh, stilted he could barely function he was highly highly deeply in introverted to the point that he had to memorize conversations before he'd speak that Even was startling a, to yeah. me. Well, he had a fantastic gift for it, but he could read something once or twice, crumple the paper, and do it word for word. And where he was meeting, even when he was meeting, I mean, there's a scene in the book where he's meeting Pearl Bailey, the, the singer, the comedian, and he memorizes uh, what he's going to say. And be, because he recognized that other people are gifted at this, he had a pattern on of falling in love with mm -hmm. other men, not mm -hmm. homosexually, mm -hmm. but the kind of men in his heart of hearts he wanted to be. Example. Uh, well, Pat Moynihan uh, was one of them, and John Kennedy uh, mm -hmm. was one of them. As Bill Sapphire would say in his own diaries, uh, when John Connolly first came to the White House and Nixon met him uh, in his diary, as they as say in there, uh, Bill Sapphire says, uh oh, the boss is in love again. And hmm. uh, what happened was Nixon did try to cre create a new political party, a party of the center taking from the, the middle of both the Democratic and Republican parties, and the candidate for president, when he could no longer run, of that party was going to be John Connolly. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. That's something that's revealed really for the first time in your book, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, because, I, I mean, many of Nixon's own personal writings to himself, uh, I was able to uncover because of the way he left the White House. Other people left in a more orderly manner, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And so that when Nixon flew away that day in 1974, all his papers and things were around. And at midnight, people went in and unpacked his desks, put them in boxes, many of which were not opened until I found them. And among them were what amounted to his diary. He would say, well, up all mm -hmm. night. But uh, talking to himself, that was the, himself. the dialogue, inner dialogue. Yeah, the internal dialogue of a of an introvert, what, and he would write what kind of man he wanted to be, what he wanted for the country, what he wanted for the world, who, is it, who he was going to get even with, 
or New Year's resolutions, I should go to church more, I shouldn't take time for exercise, uh, and I should get my health in better shape, the kind of thing that we write on New Year's Eve. But in that sense, every, every night was New Year's Eve for Nixon because every day, every hour, he kind of recreated himself, decided who he was going to be. It was an act of will and intelligence. And to succeed in politics, the greatest mm -hmm. uh, success in, in political history is becoming president. And uh, he didn't, it didn't come easily or naturally to him. And, and he worked it out on those pages. And you actually made a, uh, quoted Bob Dole. What was that wonderful line Bob Dole said about years Nixon? Years and years later, the, the people who worked for Nixon, I begin the book at a reunion of people who worked for Nixon. And Bob Dole was, was the speaker this evening uh, when they met many of these people I know, including Dole. But Bob said, from the podium, said the amazing thing was not what Richard Nixon did as president. The amazing thing is that Richard Nixon could become president, and it was that he had—he was totally different from most of the other people who held the office. The, mm -hmm. the extroverts who can't stand to be alone and who love the action and want to be at the center, where this man doesn't want to be alone, doesn't like people, even tried to uh, eliminate state dinners. Then, when he found out he couldn't eliminate them, he at least tried to shorten them so, because he was very uncomfortable sitting with people and talking with them. And he had, the first one he held was for Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada. Mm -hmm. And after the next morning, he said to Bob Haldeman, his chief of staff, we've got to make these things shorter, and I figured out the way to do it. And Haldeman said, what's that? He said, no more soup. Don't give them a soup course. Well, Haldeman, who was following orders, it walk, goes to walk over to the kitchen to tell him this new order, and he bumps into the president's valet, Manolo Sanchez, and he says, Manolo, what's going on? The president's all upset about the dinner last night. Did something happen? And Sanchez says, I don't know if something happened. I know he spilled a lot of soup on his <laughs> vest. So Haldeman then decides to walk back in the Oval Office, and he says, Mr. President, you know, about the soup, and Nixon says, stop right there, Bob. I'm going to tell you something. No more soup courses, and... Listen to this. Real men don't eat soup. So that was our boy. I mean, and every day when all this him. other stuff's going on, Vietnam's right. going on, right. and he's worrying about the soup course. Yeah. And what about in his personal life? Was he? Did he have that edge in his personal life too? I mean, here's the guy who has to rehearse conversations with people, nervous at dinner parties. Did he ever relax, even uh, with with Pat and his his daughter? I don't know. He might have relaxed at the daughter's weddings. It meant a lot to him that one daughter married Eisenhower's uh, grandson, uh, David. And, uh, but I think he, though, at those times, he had wonderful kids. He was very lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the only time I was convinced, because with a president, you can, there are still photos of everything, there's sure. film of everything. So you really see, you can look at him as if you were there. And I think he was happy then. Other than that, I don't think he was often happy. And, his greatest victories, the two greatest victories of his life, getting Pat to marry him, because mm -hmm. she was the belle of the ball. Or right. he, was, he might have been the smartest kid in town, but he was also the town nerd. Uh, I don't think he ever recovered. He didn't know how to be happy. Mm -hmm. And so that once he had won Pat's hand, he wasn't a good husband. I mean, he was no monster, but he just didn't know how to deal with success because he always expected failure. and. When he was reelected in 1972, the biggest victory in mm -hmm. oh, uh, American history, he went into depression and went off by himself, as he often did. Nixon would rarely stay two or three nights in a row under the same roof, went to Camp David all by himself, uh, and then after a couple of days got himself together and decided he would uh, redo the government. He would fire everybody and do it, but that was his way out of that depression. Mm -hmm. One of when he was campaigning before he was president, mm -hmm. before the Secret Service was everywhere, they Bob Haldeman's job was all, often uh, to find Nixon because he would get up in the middle of the night and wander through strange cities where he happened to be stopping that night in the campaign. He'd end up at coffee shops like a hopper painting, sitting at the end of the uh, counter. The all by service. himself. They, they didn't, well, when he was a candidate, yeah, they weren't know. involved. Uh, and even if they had been, they would have tried to hide it from them. 
but Haldeman would roam these towns looking till he found them. And then, of course, the only time the world ever knew about that was when he got up in the middle of the night and went without Secret Service uh, to the Lincoln Memorial during the uh, the yeah. anti-Vietnam, the great yeah. anti-Vietnam War demonstration. They didn't know where he was. He had gotten out of bed, gotten Sanchez, his his valet, and went up to Lincoln Memorial because he thought he could talk these kids, or he for he was driven to try to explain mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. to them. Of course, he wasn't particularly successful at that, but it uh, took the Secret Service and his staff a good while to find him. They didn't know the president, as they say, was out of pocket. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. I mean, it really is when, when you look at it now. I, when I first heard it, I thought, well, it's not so usual. It's, but when you consider his position and that it happened more than right. once, it wasn't just a, like yeah. it was in a crisis. Anyway, that night he then went to the Capitol and had uh, went into the House chamber and had Manolo, who had just become an American citizen, he was a Cuban, uh, give a speech with an audience of one with Nixon all alone in the White House. And he's clapping as his valet uh, give, forces him to give a speech. And the guy who was in charge of, as they say, the body mm -hmm. at that moment mm -hmm. was a guy named Bud Crow, who later got in trouble with Watergate and now is a lawyer in Seattle. But Bud told me he was st standing up there in the balcony watching this scene. He was a kid not knowing what to do and thinking, this is really strange. <laughs> well, it, so have you gotten any kind of response from the Nixon family about your book? I've got, yeah, I've done, I mean, uh, they've certainly been cordial to me, and, but the best was from George Bush, uh, who was, is in, George Bush Sr., mm -hmm. the father, mm -hmm. is in this book a lot, mm -hmm. who said that, uh, God, I love, he said, I never understood Nixon until I read this. He said, although I'll admit, uh, that before I read it, I looked in the index uh, to see what they said about me. And uh, he said, and I did, he said, I did fine. They didn't lay a glove on me. He said, except maybe for Henry Kissinger calling me an idiot all the time. So that, Isn't that interesting? Yeah, the book's become, a, you meet a lot, of, if, you, if you want to meet presidents and ex-presidents and whatnot, write books about presidents because they all come to tell you their opinion of them. I love that story, though, Bush looking in the index to see yeah. what was said about him. So uh, even within his own party, there was a great confusion about who this man was. He, most of them never, cabinet members, there were cabinet members uh, who never spoke to him. Mm. Uh, yeah. It was, he kept, and of course, as you get more and more powerful, power corrupts and all that, uh, he saw fewer and fewer people, and that's partly why he destroyed himself. There was no one to say. And his marriage wasn't to say, what are you out of your mind? Yeah. You know, you got to stop this. But nobody, there was nobody who could do that. And he was so greatly preoccupied with his own legacy, yeah. uh, even, uh, even to the point of neglecting the present. I mean, he was just preoccupied, everything documented like that. What did he want his legacy to be? Well, he was, they were all dazzled by uh, uh, Winston Churchill, you, who once said, First you make the history and then you write it before anybody else does. Uh, he wanted his legacy uh, to be the man who opened, uh, the, he didn't give a damn about domestic affairs. Yeah. Most presidents yeah. don't unless there are riots. Uh, and he wanted to be the man who made a new world. He wanted to be the architect of his times. And he was to a large member. He had a wonderful mm -hmm. mind, a wonderful architectural mind. He understood how things connected and it was out of that that came the China Initiative, uh, and the uh, and basically the prelude to globalization when he took the dollar off the gold standards. Both things he did without talking to anyone except Kissinger mm -hmm. and Conley, and he sprung these as surprises on the American people. Just came on television one night, said, "I'm going to China. Things are never going to be the same." Came on television another night, saying, "We're devaluating the dollar." the world economy will never be the same. And that surprise, say, I mean, he was able to get around the checks and balances, around the mm -hmm. Congress, around the press, uh, governing by surprise like that. And, but that in the end did him in because to keep the surprise, you needed a layer upon layer of secrets. And to keep the secrets, you needed a layer upon layer of lies. And then there came a day that it all unraveled, and he was finished. Well, and you had you had interviewed him. You knew him. I knew him. Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't say you were close because you obviously no. too philosophically no. apart for anything like that. 
and you uh -huh. knew a lot about his presidency. But as you went through the research, you read the, these notes that he's written to himself. I mean, even like talking about Kennedy, what his legacy, charm, FDR, mm -hmm. charm, and all of that. Did you, your opinion had to change of him as you read? Was, how did it change as you, you did your book? I, well, I felt sorry for him. I lived with that man for seven years. And you, you felt compassion And for him. I got to know. I mean, I, I'll tell you a story that's not in the book, but he and I once had a conversation when he was out of office and he was living in New York and he had an office in the federal building there. And I had written him saying I was writing a book retracing Alexis Tocqueville's travels, which interested him. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'd like to talk to you about that. So I went in. Uh, there was this square office in New York, a total duplicate of his presidential office, except it was an oval. We talked for two hours, and he said, boy, that was a great conversation. He loved Tocqueville as I did. Mm -hmm. And then we walked across the office. He opened the door, and exactly where the door out is in the oval office, and we walked into a stationary closet. Uh, because in this new setup, that wasn't the door out. We both backed out, pretending it didn't happen. Yeah. And then we went over to where the other door was. And he finally let me out and said, we said our farewells. But he was a, he was a brilliant fellow. The, in the interview, the conversation about Tocqueville was brilliant. But awkward, into the closet we went. Richard, thank you so much for taking time out to be with us today. We'll look forward to your biography of President Reagan. Travel safely. I will. And we'll Thanks. Look, great book, a great well, book. Thank you so much for having me. Thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud. Writing Out Loud is underwritten by Coke Industries. Coke is a proud employer of nearly a thousand Oklahomans. Coke Industries, you know us better than you think. Thank you.